This is the AT Banter Podcast, a balanced and entertaining look at assistive technology, accessibility, and its importance in people's lives. Join Rob Minot, Ryan Fleury, and Steve Barclay as they banter with people around the world about anything and everything regarding assistive technology and the disability community. Now, on with the show. Hey, and welcome to another episode of AT Banter. Banter, banter. Banter, banter. Whoa. That hey, whoa, you don't get to do the banter and the cowbell. Uh, I, get to, cowbell. I get to do whatever I want. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, we're off to a good start. Wow, we're <laughs> off to a flaming start. Fine. Apparently. Yeah. <laughs> My name is Robin O. Uh, joining me in the anti gloom Zoom room today, Mr. Ryan Flurry. Hello. Mr. Steve Barkley. What, Ryan? You're not going to say hello for me? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll give you that one. All right. Hello. Uh, and <laughs> look who's back, Mr. Rick Chant. Good afternoon. Uh, you've, it's been a while since we've had you around. Yeah, it's been a while since anybody's had me around, but that's okay. <laughs> Glad you're back. Yeah, you just say that to all the boys. Back, by, <laughs> back despite popular demand. <laughs> that's right. Um, stumbling out of the virtual pub night. That's right. Yeah, how did it go? Virtually well. I, I noticed uh, I was uh, as I was settling down to uh, record this podcast, I noticed that somebody had actually joined the uh, the pub night just just like a week ahead of time 15 minutes ago oh, that's no, funny. A, a, a day late some somebody's lost track <laughs> <laughs> too much alcohol in their system or something yeah you should just leave it open <laughs> or just people can just wander in and out and yeah, leave, leave, leave it on all the time just so the zoom bombers have a place to go yeah uh, there you go they don't hear much about that anymore Nah, because I feel like that was a fad. That was like something that some 14-year-olds liked to do a few times and then, you know. Got tired of it and that's the end of it. But they moved on. They had different stuff to do. Indeed. We have, there's bigger problems. But hey, speaking of bigger problems. Uh, Somebody's got a big problem today. No, no, nobody has a big problem today. That's right. Today is not, all... not here. I'm talking a little farther south of here. At but we're not even talking about that. Yeah, no, no we're okay. not talking about that. This is this is going to be the good news episode. That's right. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, I know. This is unlike us. So, so I guess the origins of this is uh, we were sitting around. We wanted it was International Podcast Day this week, and we yep. thought, we want to do something a little special, a little different, and we couldn't think of a goddamn thing. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> We have to give credit where credit is due. Mr. Steve Barkley came up with the idea of having a new show, but only very good news. Just good news. Yeah. Who needs all this negativity that's going around? Just good news. So I've gathered together a whole bunch of good news articles, and uh, I figure we'll just go through the good news articles and discuss them a little bit. And uh, I've grouped them. I've grouped them. We've got uh, four categories. One of them's a little weak because I could only find one article in it. But the four categories are animals, environment, medical, and people. Do we? So it, can we choose which one we want to start with? Absolutely, you can. Okay. Well, I don't know. What do you guys think? Should, people my... for eight hundred, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> so this fellow named uh, and and uh, kudos uh, credits where credit is due this is uh, from uh, a story from uh, cnn uh by uh, ala elisar uh this was published on the 13th of september uh and it's a story about a fellow named uh, christian bag who uh, was snowboarding uh, about 25 years ago in banff and he crashed and broke his neck, and uh, he was paralyzed from the waist down. Uh, but he's an out, avid outdoorsman, and uh, he wanted to get back on the mountain. So he founded this company called Bowhead Corp, and uh, the company designs bikes for people with physical disabilities. And uh, Bag himself, he's a machinist, and he has built himself a uh, mountain bike uh, uh, that is called the uh, Bowhead Reach, uh, 
and uh, it's a reverse tricycle. So you've got one uh, one wheel at the back, two wheels in front, and uh, it's equipped with heavy tread tires, a 300 watt electric motor, and an adjustable seat that allows riders to spread their legs in front of them. And uh, you can customize it. It's, it's, I mean, it's his company. He can do what he wants with them. Uh, and uh, the, the company is growing. He's got, already got more than 200 uh, orders lined up for the uh, upcoming year. And, uh, yeah, he's, uh, he's turned his uh, personal uh, challenges into a uh, total success for his company. Yeah, I took a look at the, um, at the video that was included in the, in, on the uh, story. And uh, I mean, the bike is really cool and it goes like it really, it, I don't know what, what, how powerful did you say the motor was? Uh, 300 watt. 300 that's, watt. that's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> that'll, that'll get you moving. Yeah. So, um, which I guess you would need because if you're going to, because the idea is that, you know, you're taking it on trails that a mountain bike would go on. Um, and in fact, the, the promotional video sort of shows it you know, riding with a bunch of other um, mountain bikes and to get up some of those hills and to clear some of that, that terrain, you really would need like a, a pretty, a pretty good sized motor. Well, not, not only that, the other side of that coin is it's got to be dependable. And I mean, electric mountain bikes exist, but if you pooch the battery or, you know, you run out of battery or whatever the case, you can still pedal. This guy obviously can't. Right, yeah. So the reliability has got to be huge too. Yeah, and I would think, I mean, I've seen, we've probably all seen bikes that uh, uh, work off of arm power, and that's that's just <laughs> not going to work for mm -mm. a bike that's got to go uphill or over harsh terrain because mm -mm. you just can't generate the torque that you need with upper body strength on yeah. arms to, to do that. So, you know, that's where that, that motor is going to come in handy. You know, and you know, and it's you, we hear these stories again and again. And look at like Wheelie Guitars, um, mm -hmm. you know, all these companies that are that are providing these ad adaptive products. And, and it's generally because somebody was affected by disability in their life, and they had the know-how to, you know, make something that would work for them. And then they just they transition that into a business. Um, you know, so many, we hear so many stories about businesses that start up just like this. Yeah. And they find a niche and they fill it and boom, away they go. Yeah. Like I want one of these things. <laughs> well, Lord knows you're never going to pedal up a hill. <laughs> I listen, I listen, tell me, I believe me, the place I live, uh, there's a lot of hills. So indeed, but, uh, that's the way to go. Honestly, like I'd bike way more if, if I had the option of not pedaling clicking on the motor <laughs> <laughs> that's called sky train isn't it yeah. third you want to exercise as long as you want to exercise and then you don't anymore and yeah if you're still three miles from home it's a problem <laughs> Indeed. yes it is all right what is next uh, I don't know. Do we want to keep going on the people theme or do we want to switch to a different topic uh, you know what? Let's give, give me an animal one. Give me an animal one. Okay. Let's talk about the, the okay. So this, this goes back to, uh, uh, a buddy of mine. We're, we're, we, we do these community potlucks all the time. And a buddy of mine saw me throwing out one of those six ring beer can binder things. You know, how you get those six packs and they've got the plastic wrap around them. You oh yeah. That you're out. supposed to cut if you're going to throw them away. Right. And I wasn't doing that. And he just, he, he tore me to pieces for, for not doing that. Um, and, uh, so now I do it all the time. Now I, I also actually found this website that had a t-shirt on it with a picture of a seagull with one of those six pack things wrapped it's, around it's its neck. disgusting. And, it, and it, it says, and it says bling bling underneath it. And I gave that to my buddy and he wears that all the time. <laughs> but, um, uh, this story is about a duck. Uh, and this comes from the, uh, daily mail. Uh, the uh, writer is a guy named Joe Pinkston, and he posted that uh, September 10th. Uh, duck being saved by the RSPCA, so this is in Britain, uh, after getting stuck with a plastic ring around its neck. Uh, they, uh, of course, it was from, from beer cans. And uh, they, uh, uh, 
a uh, animal collection officer named Lauren Bradshaw was one of three people to rescue the duck on a canal near Cellar Square on in Manchester, uh, August 23rd. And uh, they've turned it into a big uh, uh, publicity thing to talk about, you know, these food wrappers and, and things. Um, and not to uh, not to leave them in our environment. So uh, the experts apparently estimate that approximately 11 million tons of plastic waste end up in our oceans each year. Each year, 11 million tons. And that impacts more than 800 species of marine life. Um, so that's uh, that's extreme. Well, the plastic island is the same size as Texas. Yeah, isn't that insane? That's that's just that's just massive. Um, so they also mentioned that uh, uh, every September there's a U.S.-based environmental group called Ocean Conservancy, uh, and they hold uh, what's called the International Coastal Cleanup, which is just one day mm. of litter picking up around the world. And uh, according to their figures, last year's cleanup, uh, which involved more than 943,000 volunteers, saw 4,771,600 food wrappers collected. These included sweet wrappers, crisp packs, drink pouches, uh, all of which are typically composed of layers of non-recyclable low-density plastics. Wow. Yeah. So that's a that's a staggering, staggering amount of, of garbage. Okay, I'm not hearing the good news yet. Well, the good news is the duck's fine. <laughs> <clears throat> Wasn't there a human so, lube and one bright little spark in there? Yeah, isn't bright there? little spark. The duck's okay. Now, this does lead into another story. So I'm going to skip into the other story. This is uh, in the environment category. So, so this leads into a story which came from the Good News Network. And I, I got to tell you, goodnewsnetwork.org. If you if you've gotten yourself totally bummed out by by reading, you know, news on the internet, go to the Good News Network. And uh, if you're cited, there's a there's a, a YouTube channel called uh, Daily Dose of the Internet, which is another really good one to go to if you're if you're really uh, stressed with the news. Uh, both of them are excellent. Um, but this story is about a a California company uh, called New Light, and they have developed um, uh, cutlery, which is made from greenhouse gases. So they, they're using ocean microorganisms to convert methane into a physical material, and they're making single-use uh, straws, knives, forks, and spoons. Um, and uh, the, the, all, all of this cutlery uh, dissolves in seawater. So it looks like plastic, acts like plastic. As soon as it hits seawater, dissolves. Yeah, I saw this. This this story really, really interested me. But I have to admit that, like, I'm not like I'm so not science guy. I could not wrap my head around how how this is all works. And, like, they explain how the process works and how they make this stuff, but I cannot grok it. Like, I just yeah, that, I, I'm having a hard time with it too. Fag not grok. But I mean, this is really cool. Like that, you would think that this is revolutionary, but. Um, you know, the sad part about it is it's probably not going to get any traction because stuff like this, like there's, I don't know, I feel like you hear about these stories, but then nothing happens with it. I don't know. Uh, you know, I think uh, for, for the case of something like this, it probably comes down to a question of scalability. You know, if you can upscale this and turn it into mass production and compete with the plastics then you've you've got a winner here you know this is this is a great great idea um uh it's called uh, restore foodware by the way so their their website if you want to look at it is restorefoodware.com uh, w-a-r-e for where it's, it's not uh, i'm on their website here and, and it's actually not that expensive either they're jumbo straws uh, you get 50 wrapped jumbo straws for 9.99 with free shipping uh the reusable cutlery uh, is uh, currently six ninety nine a set. Ah, uh, that's not bad. Now they refer to a standard for marine degradable, uh, and it's ASTM D seven zero eight one and D six six nine one. There you go. So that standard will probably tell you what the 
degrade time is or what the requirement is to meet that standard, but I, I, it doesn't actually say on the website here exactly. Mm. It does say that when it degrades, though, it also does turn into food for, uh, for fish. Yeah, that's right. So it's like a, it's almost like enters the, the food chain. Yeah. Yeah, that's that is really cool. And, you know, the, the article also mentioned another another company, uh, Covalent. I don't know if you went and took a look at that, but oh, the one making wallets, they make wallets and sunglasses out of out of this air carbon. That's yeah, that's pretty cool. You know, again, this this speaks to, you know, the, all this technology. It's it's there if, if we just would embrace it, if we could just stop being meatheads about you know the climate we could we could change it tomorrow by implementing all this stuff and it really wouldn't impact our quality of life and we just we just have to do it yeah. uh, tell that to the albertans and the texans yeah well. <laughs> I'm, I'm still having a hard time I don't know. wrapping my head around this yeah. i don't know i i don't think you can you can necessarily blame it on any group i think you got to blame it on education yeah you know if anything you know uh, we we get out here, particularly on the west coast. We we got a lot of hippies who are out there spouting stuff like this, um, so we hear about it a lot. In Alberta, you don't necessarily get that, and we right. all live in our own echo chambers, right? So, it's just a matter of education. It's getting the word out there to people to to say, hey, you know, this this technology can exist. It can be used. It's got these benefits, you know, and yeah. you know, it's not going to threaten your lifestyle. For goodness sakes. Yeah, that's a good point. You know, it's like all the all good stuff. I mean, we say that all the time about assistive technology too. It's the the education part of it is is the challenge. It's getting the word out there that this stuff exists, or getting the word out there that this particular service, like say, audio description, for example, it's out there. If people would make noise about it and m create a, a demand for it, we could make it happen. Yeah. All right, guys. So. Animals, environment, medical, or people? Medical. Medical. Okay, I've only got one in the medical category, so we're, we're, we're maxing this one out here. But uh, this is another story that I found on the Good News Network. And uh, this is by uh, Andy, uh, Andy Corbley. This is from uh, September 28th of this year. And this is about a drug uh, which repairs nerve damage uh, giving sci scientists hope for a future uh, multiple sclerosis uh, treatment. So um, the autoimmune disorder, MS, uh, micro multiple sclerosis, um, the, the problem, or the, the, what, what happens is a protective layer of uh, lipids around nerves in the brain and spinal cord, which is called the myelin sheath, it's targeted by immune cells and uh, it, it breaks down that, that sheath, and that causes the disease's um, uh, uh, symptoms. Um, so the trial showed that this, uh, this new drug, uh, which has just uh, uh, done a, a phase two clinical trial, uh, this drug's called uh, uh, Bexor, Bexorotene, uh, it was able to effectively re-myelinate the damaged nerves, um, so it, it actually rebuilds that that myelin sheath again. Um, this this drug was originally used for cancer patients, but uh, it could be used um, as a uh, treatment for for MS. So they're starting to they're starting to work with it. Obviously, it's only gone through phase two trials; hasn't gone to phase three trials. But uh, sh you know, should this work out? Uh, this could be absolutely revolutionary for people who are suffering from MS. Yeah, yeah, wow. Yeah, it's actually a story I'm I'm going to forward to Linda's cousin who is living with MS right now. And as the years go by, you know, she's getting more and more debilitated, right? Losing her mobility. and So it's very interesting to see and keep looking forward to, you know, we're hearing more and more all the time about, you know, existing drugs that are, proving to be beneficial for other diseases and illnesses as well. So it won't be long and we will all be superhuman, healthy as a horse. Wouldn't that be great? Yes, that actually would be great. Now we're down to animals, environment, or people. I'm going to go with people. Okay, I'm, I'm saving, I'm saving, I think, what I, what I view as being the best for last on the people category. We've got one more after this one. Uh, but uh, but this, one, this one comes from close to home. Uh, this is a story about a woman who uh, had her teddy bear stolen. 
Now that in, in and of itself, you wouldn't think would be such a big deal. Uh, but uh, for Mara Soriano, uh, she had uh, uh, a backpack in uh, her truck and somebody picked it up and, and made off with it. And what was stolen was a, um, a super sentimental Build-A-Bear because the Build-A-Bear contained the final message that her mother recorded for her just before she passed away from cancer last year. And the message said, I love you, I'm proud of you, I'll always be with you. Now, if that doesn't make you tear up, I don't, I don't think anything is going to. But local celebrity and hero to all, Ryan Reynolds posted out on Twitter. And Oh, hey, Ryan, you got a cowbell there, man. Uh, he posted out on Twitter, Vancouver, $5,000 to anyone who returns this bear to Mara. Zero questions asked. I think we all need this bear to come home. Well, that hit the CBC News. It went viral. Uh, and guess what? She got the she, bear back. She got the bear back. So that's that's just a great story. And you got to give uh, kudos to uh, to Ryan for using his celebrity to amplify the message yeah. and to get it back to her and, and uh, to, to really really bring a, a heartwarming ending to uh, to that story that's right and somebody got five grand worth of coke <laughs> <laughs> maybe yeah it could be <laughs> yeah he just you know uh, the dude comes across as just uh, like a super nice guy you know every every everything you hear about him you, you just you, you just think geez the dude's really nice let's get him on the podcast yeah, he, he probably kills people in his spare time or something. <laughs> probably. Yeah. yeah, no, he's so laid back. That just makes me think that that Scarlett Johansson must be a giant pain in the ass. <laughs> Why, was, he, was, he, was he dating ScarJo? Weren't they married? I were they? Married. I don't know. Oh, or maybe they were engaged, or maybe they were just dating. I don't know. Who, who can keep track of entertainment news out of 2006? But <laughs> Yeah, I don't, I don't follow that stuff at all. It's, you know, it's like, give me, give me your movies. I don't care about your life. Carry on. Uh, yeah. I mean, if you, if you can't stay together with Ryan Reynolds, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> All right. So what's next? Uh, well, we got uh, three animal and three environment. So what will it be? Animal or environment? Animal. Animal. All right. Okay. Well, this is, this is another one that uh, for me, it, has kind of a personal connection to it. It's a story about two beluga whales uh, were set free after uh, nearly a decade in captivity. Uh, they are uh, uh, in a, a sanctuary in uh, Kletsvik Bay in Iceland, and uh, they're enjoying their first taste of open water in nine years thanks to a relocation project there. So they were captured off the coast of Russia in 2011 and spent years in a Chinese aquarium where they were trained to perform in front of audiences. Um, and then they were um, uh, traveled 6,000 miles, flying for 30 hours to the world's first open water sanctuary for belugas. Got there August 8th, 2020. And uh, they're in their sea sanctuary pools now, uh, living, living the life in the uh, actual ocean again. Um, and and for me the the reason this this strikes home for me is because uh in here in vancouver we've got the vancouver aquarium who has captive beluga whales in it and there's always always a, a, a big uh discussion about whether or not we should have uh, whales in captivity and one of the arguments constantly made is oh you can't reintroduce them back into the wild and i think this kind of puts the uh puts the the, the lie to that um, you know, these animals can be rehabilitated. They can go back into the wild. We just don't need to keep them in little tiny pools all the time. So. But is this actually where they released back into the open wild ocean or is this still a sanctuary? Because there's a difference. Yeah, well, it is It is a sanctuary. Uh, I don't know what the ultimate um, plan is for these guys. Right. Um, but, uh, but they are working towards final release. Hmm. So they've got uh, they've got a healthcare team and uh, a, you know a team of uh, veterinarians and they're hoping to actually release them back into the wild. Yeah, it's tricky. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'd so like to see operated... that be a success, though. Oh, for yeah, sure, absolutely. Uh, this is uh, the sanctuary is operated by the Sea Life Trust, 
uh, and it was built with the support of generous donation from Merlin Entertainments and created in partnership with Whale and Dolphin Conservation. And it's really cool. So we wish them all the best. Uh, it would be great to see uh, those animals that have been kept in tiny, tiny little enclosures for so long to be able to get back out there and enjoy the remaining years of their lives in, in the ocean. It's one of those things where you just hope that, you know, you don't release them and then they immediately go to try to make a friend with an orca whale and get eaten. Yeah, yeah, you hope you hope it doesn't turn into something like that. But uh, but that's, that's really dark there, Rob. Yeah, thanks yeah for, so much uh, for the good that news show. Spin on the good news show. <clears throat> yeah. I just, but I, I only mean that just in the sense that, so, I mean, that's, but I imagine, imagine that's the challenge of reintroducing an animal into the wild that's never, that, that's never had that problem, that's literally been raised and lived in an enclosure i mean i'm sure that that's part of the fear right mm -hmm. is it well to feed themselves or they don't know how to do any of that but but then again i don't know like well these aren't these aren't animals that were bred in captivity they were captured they were captured in russia these so they, particular they, ones yeah i think what he's yeah, saying they, is for ones that are um well, born in captivity yeah and that's yeah. what the argument that you hear i suppose and i guess that's what that's what they're talking about when they make that argument yeah these guys in particular i mean just let them go like well there's there's far far fewer um animals in, in these type of show environments that are bred in captivity because it's really really hard to breed them in captivity um so what what typically happens is they they grab them from the wild and they ship them to parks all over the world you know this is the reason that i will not do those those uh dolphin swim things with, uh, yeah, with captive dolphins you you i will never give those people my money because you know if you've ever watched uh, the cove for example um, mm -hmm. uh, the the movie that um uh not sea shepherd society what was the name of them uh, ocean, ocean island institute uh put out um it's horrific what they what they put these animals through to fuel things like that so people can go and get their picture taken rubbing a rubbing a dolphin in a pool yeah it's um, ridiculous yeah i agree with that and, and even like even aquariums in general or, or any of those like shows like sea world and stuff like that that just all seems like really stupid to me like sitting and and you know having a, an animal in captivity just so it can do jumps and stuff just so some tourists can go ooh and ah and that's yeah I, I think that's gross i i think that it served a purpose at one point but i don't think it serves a purpose anymore you know back when they started that here you know certainly here in vancouver um killer whales were thought to be these these vicious uh scary creatures of the sea and the fishermen used to shoot at them uh uh, all the time like they, they they were terrified of them and they would they would fire shotguns at them to to chase them off um when when vancouver aquarium started bringing them in and doing whale shows with them they they were able to show people that you know hey these are these are social creatures and the education started and people started to learn that okay you know these are not um scary monsters these are you know wonderful complex creatures but we don't we don't need to have them in a pool to do that anymore because we've got years and years and years worth of oceanography video and and you know all all kinds of multimedia experience with these animals that we can we can show to kids these days to educate right. them about that we they don't have to go see them in a pool anymore it's true we have the we have the national geographic channel yeah yeah exactly. channel all right what's next What's next? All right. Well, we talked about making cutlery out of methane, but did you know where one of the biggest sources of methane on our planet comes from? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. This Cows. Is Cows go moo. And they also oh, make poo. farty noises. <laughs> and Our they, gassy uh, animals. That's right. They are very, very <laughs> gassy animals. So... Uh, this Australian company, uh, and again, this is from Good News Network, God love you guys, uh, by Andy Corbley again, and uh, this is about an Australian company that has produced a seaweed-based dietary supplement for dairy and beef cows that eliminates 80% of methane content emitted by the animals. So here's, here's, the, here's the really impressive number here. If only 10% 
of global cattle herds consumed the supplement created by a future feed limited, it would be the same as taking 50 million cars off the road. That's crazy. Yeah, I was stunned at this number. I, do you think that's great? That is crazy. Like it is. Ten percent. Yeah. Yeah, and it's and it's it's made from seaweed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't even know. I like that's again that's stunning to me. That's something that could be revolutionary and change the planet if it like gets some traction. If if everybody starts to use this stuff, but. You know, that's always the eternal question. Like, you know, what what's stopping us from just rolling this out immediately? Well, I mean, people have to buy into it. People have to be willing to purchase this product and feed it to their cows. So you you almost have to make it an, an incentive to to get people to use this. Because, um, you know, otherwise they're just not going to, unless there's some reason for them to. They're not going to, but, but methane, you know, we talk about reducing greenhouse gases and, you know, a, a lot of countries signed on to the Paris Accord, which was all about reducing greenhouse gases. Well, cattle, um, you know, they, they produce, uh, just through their burps, about 5% of the greenhouse gases in the world. But that 5% is methane, which is about 20 times, or sorry, 28 times more powerful than carbon dioxide at warming the earth. So it's a it's an it's an incredibly problematic gas to have going up into the atmosphere all the time. So it's a good way, you know, it's a good way that uh, countries who are producing a lot of beef could uh, help meet their targets for for uh, uh, climate re uh, reductions. Or they could just uh, have some kind of a uh, little sparker that sparks uh, on the back end of the cow when it farts and uh, it just blows the methane off. I'm just, I'm just picturing a field of cows. <laughs> Inst instant barbecue, man. <laughs> Every now and then one gets particularly gassy and you just see this entire cow go. <laughs> I feel like you'd have a winning YouTube channel. You just have a cow. <laughs> Exploding cows. <clears throat> well, if they can do uh, cow tipping. Sick, I tell you. You know, but, uh, but honestly, like this is... Um, what do we feed cows anyways? Just grain? Grain. Yeah, grain, corn, grass. So that would so that would save on the corn. So we wouldn't have to grow as much corn. Like I don't know. No, really... no, it's a, it's a supplement. It's not it's not their main feed. It's just a supplement that you add to add to their feed. Right. You don't have to eat it all. It, it, it's just uh, a, a supplement. But at what cost, right? I mean, farmers are 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 not going to be putting out tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars for this supplement um, and and not pass on that cost to the consumer. Right, could it, but it, could, it, sure. could it not be like vehicles? You buy an electric vehicle, you get like a carbon credit or however that works, you know? Could that not be offset? Yeah, there, there's ways to offset that for sure. Animals or environment? I would All like right. animals. Animals. So, uh, one of the things we regularly hear uh, is um, uh, people bagging on the United States for uh, lax environmental regulations, particularly under the current administration. But did you know that the U.S. Senate uh, just in July passed the Driftnet Modernization and Bycatch Reduction Act? Bless you. I did not know that. You did not know that. Well, let me tell you, they did. Please do. <laughs> and uh, what it does is it it uh, phases out giant nets used for sword fishing that trap marine mammals, seabirds, and turtles in the federal waters off the coast of California. Uh, the only place the nets are still used is in the United States. So these drift gill nets, they can be uh, more than a Miles mile long. long. Yeah, and they're left in the ocean overnight to catch uh, uh, typically swordfish and thresher sharks or what they're after, but you, they can pick up whales, dolphins, sea lions, sea turtles. Uh, Anything that comes to the surface. Yeah, and these drift gill nets can be damaged in storms. They can end up floating free in the ocean and just killing everything that, they, that happens into them. Hmm. So... Um, they say that between 2001 and 2015, the gillnet industry inadvertently caught 753 dolphins, 
507 seals and sea lions, 112 seabirds, 53 whales, and 35 sea turtles. Wow. And they've finally been able to get legislation passed to uh, ban them uh, off California. Uh, and that will be the last place uh, that they Globally? are used in the U.S. Yeah, so they were, they're already banned in uh, the U.S. territorial waters off the Atlantic Ocean, Gulf of Mexico, as well as the coasts of Washington, Oregon, Alaska, and Hawaii. <laughs> However, they remain legal in federal waters off the coast of California. So this closes off California. It's the last uh, place that uh, they're allowed to be used. So now we got to go after the international places where they're still using these. But at least our friends to the south have packed it in on these things. Well, and you know, here's the thing that here's the way I feel about it. Like, I know you got like, okay, so granted, I have to admit, I'll just admit to the audience right now, I'm not a seafood guy anyways, but I feel like, you know what, if you're going to eat an animal, at least make it a level playing field in terms of how you capture and kill that animal. So I feel like, like putting out a mile wide net, that's not even giving a fish a chance. Fine. Go on a, on a boat, go sit with a rod, and go try to catch it that way. And look, then if you get a fish, great, fine. You get to get home, you get to eat it. I, I feel like that's fair. But, you know, this, you know, factory farming the ocean with all these giant nets, not fair at all. So that's my take on it. Good, good riddance to these nets. I think if you want a fish, go out, get a pole, go catch it yourself. Rod. And so to all you fish farmers out there, email cowbell at atbanter.com. <laughs> That's right. Let's talk about bees. Oh, yeah. This is a cool story. All right. This, this is a good story because we've been hearing in the news all the time about colony collapses yep. of bees all over the place. And there's been a lot of publicity around it. And they've been talking about, you know, how it could be pesticide use. It could be viral. It could be all kinds of things. Well, this is, this is a, a story that again, good news network. Thanks guys. And thanks Andy Corbley who did this one as well. Do they have another writer at that place? I don't know. Andy, <laughs> you're, you've got this. Um, so, um, in uh, recent data collections released by the U.S. Department of Agriculture, some states are experiencing growths in colony numbers of 70% or more. Uh, so uh, states experiencing the broadest increase are Michigan, Nebraska, Oklahoma, and Maine, and they've added tens of thousands of colonies of uh, thriving uh, bees. So this is, this is a big deal because, you know, if if these go, we're done. Like literally, we're done. If there's no pollinators, uh, forget food. Yep. I mean, we're we're just gonna have you know a massive drought and we'll all die. Um, and uh, so you need your bees, and uh, it, it's nice to see that. Uh, you know, I'm sure there's still colony collapses going on in places, but it's really nice to see them rebounding in some place because uh, we need we need rebounds. Yeah, and I wonder what's causing the rebounds. Because they were saying like seventy percent have increased that's those, that's in, in those some horny states. Little queens, that's what it is. Yeah, but what is it about uh, these states? You know, there's got to be something because you know, like Steve said, we're hearing about the bee population collapse all over the place and all the time. Yet these guys seem to be doing something right, or the bees are attracted yeah, the, to the something. The article doesn't seem to go into that a whole lot. Yeah, it doesn't, doesn't say why why these increases were they do mention a couple of different things like the new york bee sanctuary is offering gardening and landscape practices uh, it talks about how there's plants like dandelions for example that are important um, mm -hmm. uh, food food stuff for for bees particularly in in the early spring so so you know let your uh, let your dandelions bl bloom when they start to you know go to seed you can pick them but but let let the big yellow bits go because bees need those um, but yeah, they don't actually say why why they're uh, they're coming back in these places like they are, but but they are. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, them disappearing in the first place was a bit of a mystery. I mean, we weren't really sure why why colonies were dying out. So yeah, there was there was a lot of talk about uh, what do they call them neo nicotine neo nicotid uh, basically pesticides based on nicotine um, hmm. uh, was was one of the um, neo nicotinoids neonicotinoids is that what they're called yes uh, um and uh, uh 
that that was one of the the prime suspects. I don't know that they ever conclusively proved that because certainly the industry was pushing back on that. But uh, um, that's that's one possible culprit. Pesticides are definitely the highest likelihood of why they were dying off. That's very cool. Indeed. Okay. We got one more animal, okay. one more environment, and one more people. Okay, let's go. Let's go with the people. Go with the people. Okay, this one. This one just cracked me up. All right. Uh, come on, open up, please. Thank you. Okay. So, a man from Albany uh, was out swimming in uh, Lake George. Uh, or sorry, he was kayaking. Along that's the, the that's the start of a, a limerick, right? Uh, there once was a man from Albany. No, carry on. <laughs> no, it's a it's short a, a vowel or a, a syllable rather. Uh, so yes, so uh, Jimmy McDonald, former amateur boxer and it, now a drug treatment counselor, was kayaking along the shore just north of Lake George Village when things started to go badly. So he's going along, doo -doo -doo, water got choppy. As he paddled harder, he tipped over and he lost his paddle. He was in about 30 feet of water. His life jacket didn't fit particularly well. It was coming up over his head. He was holding onto the kayak with one hand and his new $1,400 smartphone with the other. He was trying to keep his, uh, keep, kept trying to right the kayak. And that's when I said, all right, I think I might die today. I think this might be it. I prayed to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to help. And then... Dum dum dum. A <laughs> sorry, this still this still cracks me up. A floating tiki bar, <laughs> which was full of priests and seminarians from the Paulist Fathers, a Catholic <laughs> retreat on the lake, <laughs> <laughs> floated up to him and rescued him. <laughs> yep. <laughs> oh, All right, now I am I'm not a Christian, but. If I was praying to God at that moment and a bunch of Catholics <laughs> pulled up in a tiki bar, I, damn it, I'm life. a believer. <laughs> Gracious Heavenly Father. <laughs> I'm getting myself baptized. You're not wrong. <laughs> right then and there by everybody on that other boat. Absolutely. Oh, my blessed you have margarita. <laughs> a tiki bar. <laughs> oh, dear. Yeah, that's 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 just too funny. Yeah, but well, but I, I want to know what a bunch of priests were doing on a floating tiki bar. Well, drinking. Re retreat. Uh, the Catholics. That's dude, all they do. A dude <laughs> rescued. Okay, that's great. That happens. All I want to know the story about the priests on the tiki bar. Don't you know any Catholics? My goodness. <laughs> that's true. Good point. They go to church and they drink. That's it. <laughs> one on one, animals and environment. 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 All right. Zero Avia launches the world's first hydrogen powered passenger plane. Yeah, I saw that. Um, uh, so let's see. This is so Zero Avia has uh, completed the world's first hydrogen fuel cell powered flight of a commercial grade aircraft. Uh, it was partly funded through the UK government. Uh, the flight in Cranfield, England, used four pounds, six ounces of hydrogen fuel and reached an altitude of a thousand feet. It was a Piper six plane or six seat plane. Um, and uh, they're basically working to bring this to uh, commercial availability and to make it uh, competitive with um, other commercial airliners. So right now they are... Um, uh, targeting to have a 250 mile zero emission flight before the end of the year, uh, which would allow them to service major routes such as Los Angeles to San Francisco or London to Edinburgh. So short hop flights, but you think about it, that's perfect for Vancouver to Kelowna, uh, for Vancouver to Victoria. Um, you know, there's a lot of short flights that people do. Uh, that could be served by small uh, commercial hydrogen-powered aircraft. Well, the the uh, Har was it Harbor Air? Yeah. Uh, just recently did an all-electric um, takeoff and landing with their CEO at the at the controls. Nice. Um, 
and it's the first one of its kind. Um, I don't know who's pouring all the money into the research and development, but th that was a first as well. Yeah, I mean, uh, there's just a ton, a ton of, of pollution that comes from air travel. Um, um, you know, less so now because so so many fewer people are, are traveling at the moment, because yeah, of, because of COVID. But but um, you know, ultimately, we need a revolution in air travel to cut back on the amount of uh, pollution we're putting into the atmosphere from from jet planes. So this is uh, this is a really cool development. You know, if if you could fly, you know. 10, 10 of these instead of you know one bigger uh, fuel powered uh, aircraft um, you could uh, you could make a huge difference so you know what I'm uh, I've heard this I've heard this news story before about this about this uh, uh, about this vehicle air vehicle that was using hydrogen uh, I was big in the 30s I feel like no the Hindenburg <laughs> kaboom <laughs> And then, yeah, <laughs> I, wait a minute. I, didn't we learn our lesson? I thought hydrogen was bad. Yeah, we did learn our lesson. That's why we're still looking at doing it again, but better, safer, more efficiently. <laughs> yeah, there's a big there's a big difference between uh, hydrogen in an enclosed fuel tank, pressurized fuel tank, and hydrogen in a, a massive wind bag. A balloon. wind yeah. bag. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. I just was checking. <laughs> I just feel like I'm not sure that I would get on something that that its its main selling feature was it was filled with hydrogen. They yeah. wouldn't even tell you, Rob. Yeah. Okay, but that's fair which, enough. Which which reminds me of a joke. What's the difference between Rush Limbaugh and the uh, the the Hindenburg? What? One of them's a giant flaming gas bag, and the other one's a dirigible. All right. Last one. Last one. Well, we keep hearing about animals going extinct. But the Kenyan Wildlife Service announced Wednesday at uh, Ambo, Amboseli National Park that their elephant population has more than doubled since 1989. There were just 16,000 elephants in Kenya in 1989. That number has now grown to 34,000. And they attribute that partly to a decrease in poaching uh, due to greater fines and stronger jail terms. Uh, and uh, in this year alone, they have had 170 elephant calves born. So this is, this is the right direction for elephant populations. They used to have, in the 1970s, Africa used to have 1.3 million elephants. Today, it's only got 500,000. So... Uh, and, and less than 30,000 are uh, apparently living in the wild now. Um, so this is, this is a really, this is a great story because uh, uh, elephants were on their way out and uh, it was entirely possible that we would one day see a world without elephants, but they're coming back. That is good news. Yeah. I know I edit the show, but I the part of me really wanted to hear you say, and they've attributed that to elephants <laughs> <laughs> frisky critters aren't they yes, indeed. <laughs> well i'm mean, really that's all we need to just need we just need them to f and then we just <laughs> bring them and that's really that's it's not rocket science that's, that's how we bring species back is just leave them alone that's right it's the director the director of the big elephant willies about the size of your leg rob <laughs> They, they said, all, all we did was we put out a bunch of loudspeakers and started playing Barry White. That's Boom, right. There, there. That's right. <laughs> that just stop killing them. No, that's that's excellent, too. That is, that's some serious good news. Well, gentlemen. Time to wrap her up? I think so. Well, look at that. I'm just, I'm filled with optimism. Excellent. Well, that was the whole plan. Listen, let's sum it up. Like, so the bees are coming back. We've got more elephants. Uh, we've got a duck that was didn't die from a beer can. Plant. Solution to solution to uh, the methane gas issue for cows. Yeah, yeah drift, drift nets aren't going to kill uh, sea turtles, whales, and dolphins anymore off California. Yeah, we've got some plastic cutlery that actually biodegrades and turns into food in the ocean. They they may have found a, uh, a good treatment for MS. Yeah, I mean, life is good. A, there's a Canadian-made mountain bike that can uh, even take Rob up a mountain. That's right. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's, yeah, and it's Friday. 
And and Ryan Reynolds, we're we're totally gonna fix up his grinder feed for him. Yeah. Hey Ryan. Rob. Uh, where can people find us? They can find us online at atbanter.com. They can also drop us a line if they so desire, if they want to tell us how awesome the show was, or if they would like to suggest a show, or they want to be on the show, or they just want to say hello. Or if it's Ryan Reynolds and he wants to come on the show. Uh, cowbell at atbanter.com. And hey, I heard that we're also on Facebook and Twitter, as well as Instagram in some limited capacity. That's correct, sir. Um, okay, well, you know what? That is definitely going to about do it for us this week. Uh, join us next week for regular scheduled programming. Uh, happy International Podcasting Day to everybody out there, all our fellow podcasters. And uh, we'll see everybody next week. This podcast has been brought to you by Canadian Assistive Technology, providing low vision and blindness solutions across Canada. Find us online at www.canastech.com. That's C-A-N-A-S-S-T-E-C-H dot com. Or call us toll free at 1-844-795-8324. For all your assistive technology servicing needs, call Chaos Technical Services at 778-847-6840 or find them online at chaostechnicalservices.com. 